Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me, if you would, for the, for the first part in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. We're, we're going to, as we do each year, we, co we come around the times of the feasts and festivals of the Lord and we educate ourselves. We get a, an understanding of what, of what God has set, uh, not only in, in a moment of time, but throughout time. Uh, God has set these things in place as times and seasons before the uh, different events uh, that God put in place took place, before the Passover lamb came, before the, the outpouring of the, the first fruits of God and, and the unleavened, before the uh, Shavuot, uh, uh, the, the actual word of God coming and the outpouring of the Spirit of God, these things were already uh, in place eternally. And the same with the latter feasts of the year of trumpets, of atonement, and of, of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. These things are, are uh, these three things specifically are in the future, and yet they have been there uh, for eternity. They've been in the heart of God. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 gives us an understanding or a key to the peoples on the earth today. And it simply says this in the King James Version, says this, Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's a very clear uh, indication of in the mind and the heart of God, on this time, since the crucifixion and the shed blood of Christ, there are three people groups on the earth. There are the Jews... There are the Gentiles, literally goyim or people outside of a covenant. The nations, in other words. All the rest of the nations. Nor to the church of God. So the church of God is no longer considered Gentile. It is no longer categorized as the nations. It is by its own classification now, one man in Christ as a new creation, a new being. You cannot be part of that body, that, that uh, anointed one and his anointing outside of Christ, outside of Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. There is still a place for the Jews, a covenant with the Jews. And as we're going to see today, the God has had a purpose in actually covering their minds or their eyes, I should say, so that they don't see uh, everything as clearly as you would just naturally see with your natural eyes. So there is a purpose in the Jew on the earth, still in the covenant of God and in the future of, 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 our, of the nations and the nation of Israel. Now, before the cross then, there was only two people groups on the earth. There were the Jews and the, the Gentiles. Uh, before Abraham, really, there was really just people, <laughs> you know. But God brought covenant. God came in a covenant with, first of all, of course, Adam. Uh, there was the sons of Adam is what we're talking about to start with. Then, of course, Noah. And then the nations were no longer. They would have been corrupted with uh, all sorts of uh, mixed seed in terms of uh, demonic activity and so forth. And then Noah and his family were left. And so God made a covenant with Noah. And that was passed down. And Shem, Ham, and Yepheth had that covenant covenant as the three sons of Noah, and as we looked at earlier, Shem passed that on to Abraham by the Spirit of God as a high priest of God. And through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, that was passed down uh, through Isaac and that blessing through him. Uh, and through Jacob, Israel, the, the lineage and the covenant and the promises of God were continually manifest and still are. And we're going to see that. But now through that lineage of Jacob, through the tribe of Judah, one was born who was prophesied, who was born without the seed of man, without the seed uh, stained by sin, the promised Mashiach, the Messiah, and he was born in through the tribe of Judah and became the Mashiach of all mankind, the Messiah. Jesus is his name and hallelujah for that. Amen. Praise God. So there's lots of things still in play. 
I've heard many people say, well, on the cross Jesus said it, it, it is finished. That was the finished work of the cross and there's nothing else to be done. Well, there's some truth in that, in that it is a complete and final and finished work of the cross. There's nothing needs to be added to the work of the cross. But that fulfilled a specific sacrifice and it closed out the pages of some of the sacrificial manifestation of the priestly order and so forth. And there was an individual redemption that was paid for through the blood of the Lamb that is for the individual to say yes to God, to be set free from sin and hell and death. And for uh, uh, you can not only for the individual, but for your household. You know, on the blood of the Lamb, you can believe God for your, you and your household. Amen. Hallelujah. You don't have to let go of that. It's always sad when you hear of a loved one who goes and you're not sure of their salvation. You know, but you, we, we've got a, actually a responsibility to believe for our household, to believe for every member of our household. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, then we, so we, we see that there were two peoples. Now there's three peoples, the, the Jews the church, or the, the nations and the, and the church. Yom Kippur deals with all three. Uh, even though the church itself wasn't uh, known, it was hidden, it was a mystery through the Old, the old Testament, there, there are types and shadows and there are prophetic images uh, of that. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 and we're going to find out what we're talking about here. Leviticus chapter 23 the old is the new concealed, and the new is the old revealed. Amen? And chapter 23 of Leviticus specifically goes through and lists all of the feasts of the Lord. You can see them in their respective uh, parts. In verse 1 and 2, it talks about the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations. God says, they are my feasts. Uh, you can go through and you'll find the Passover from verse 4. You'll find feast, first fruits from verse 9, feast of weeks from verse 15, feast of trumpets we talked about last week from verse 23, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur from verse 26, which is today, and then the feast of tabernacles, or, uh, which is in a, in a few weeks' time. So verse 26 and 27, let's just read that. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying... Also the tenth day of this month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation, a dress rehearsal. We act like it exactly is that day. For you, you shall afflict your souls and offer an, may, offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, atonement, uh, the Hebrew word kippur, yom kippur, yom means day, kippur. Uh, literally means uh, to cover. The word kippah, uh, a kippah, uh, a covering, a head covering, is, comes from that word. It's also from the root word kafar, uh, which is derived from kafa, which means to ransom or redeem. So these things are all interconnected here. Now, uh, backing up into Leviticus 16, verse 33. It says, Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of the meeting, and for the altar. He shall make atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the assembly. Now this was just a descriptive of some of the things that this day of atonement was specifically made for. The sanctuary, the tabernacle, the altar, the priests, and for the people. Specifically the people of Israel. This is not a day which signifies the redemption for the Christian, for the church, uh, but it is a day which has uh, a redemption for the nations in it, should the nations or should somebody want to receive redemption. There's a plan in there for the nations, for the Gentiles. Uh, but it is also a prophetic, redemptive plan and, and purpose for the nation of Israel in the future, still to come. It's also an important day for the church to understand and embrace because it is a holy convocation or a dress rehearsal for that future time. Just as last week we talked about trumpets being a representation or a prophetic image of the day when we will meet Jesus in the clouds when we hear that trumpet blast of the rapture. There's a name that people have put around that. Uh, the catching away of the church. Th this is also a day uh, of great representation. Uh, this represents the day of the Lord. This represents a day when, uh, when, when um, there is a, a, a redemptive purpose uh, that is going to be for mankind. Um, and so let's look again, Leviticus chapter 16, reading from verse 6. 
Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the, Lord, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron shall cast two lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Have you heard the word scapegoat before? We use that still today uh, to try to put the blame on someone else, right? They make them the scapegoat. That's where we get the word from. That's the understanding of this. This is where it started. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. So, just to give you a base, basic understanding, and you don't need to know all of this stuff inside and out. This is, this is stuff that has been uh, done uh, by Jews for many, many years, but it, it is a prophetic image of what's to come. So it's good for us to learn this. There were three sacrifices, one bull, two goats. Say one bull, two goats. All right, just, just to get it clear in our minds. The bull was a sin offering for Aaron and his house. The goat sacrificed as a sin offering and one goat presented before the Lord to make atonement, which was then sent away into the wilderness. The Azazel. Can you say Azazel? Azazel. The scapegoat. Azazel. All right. Then in Leviticus 23 again, verse 27, also the tenth day of this of the seventh month should be a day of atonement. It should be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls. Now, what that means is basically it's, it's a, a day of fasting. It was representative of denying yourself. There are actually, there are actually five things uh, that the Jews deny themselves of, uh, certain pleasures uh, and, and things that they have uh, that they can do other days. Um, but they, they just draw, they stay aside um, as a holy day and things that they won't participate on. So the afflicting of the soul or the fast, as it's referred to, uh, an offering made by fire of the Lord. Now, this particular uh, Yom Kippur, when does it happen? It happens next Friday evening. So the 29th of September at 5.29 p.m. in Brisbane. Just to be very specific with you. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, exact, that's the exact moment. Uh, that's when the sun is officially uh, sundown. Uh, through Erev, or evening, of Saturday the 30th, uh, which is exactly 6.22 p.m. So if you're going to fast, 6.23 p.m., have something to eat. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, the first day of atonement, what was, what was that all about? What was the imagery of that? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 32. Um, Exodus chapter 32, and we find Moses. And from verse 30, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, All these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Now, this is an amazing statement. Moses is actually saying, uh, if, if blotting me out would mean them all been written in, then blot me out. I mean, that's a big thing, to say I will go to hell for them. I will be separated from you if they would all be able to come in. Now, now in these particular days, uh, the Jewish people believe, and they take it from scriptures like this and others, that there are days which are represented from the trumpet blast of Rosh Hashanah right through these 10 days up to Yom Kippur. Uh, they call them the days of awe. It's a, a time of teshuva or repentance that's been going on for 40 days. But these particular days, on, uh, on, on these particular days, already the righteous names are written in, in the book and the unrighteous names are written, but everybody else, which is the majority of people, uh, they've got this, these 10 days where, they've got, they, where they can just get themselves right before God. And interestingly, it's been an interesting time in Israel's history where, uh, where young, young men, especially young soldiers, young men and women, young soldiers, seem to have gotten themselves right. And especially where things like the Yom Kippur War, there was an unprecedented number of people that had gone to synagogue and, and just gotten right with God before that particular particular time. Very, very interesting. Uh, so, so there's an affliction of the soul or a, a particular um, 
a, a fasting that goes on here. And Moses is in an intercessory place right here where he is standing on behalf of a nation and saying, Lord, blot me out if it means they will be saved. Moses, of course, went up the mountain for Shavuot. He was there for 40 days. Uh, the people sin. He comes down. He, he's, he really is in intercession for another 40 days, trying to stand on behalf of the people. And then he goes up the mountain again for a second time for another 40 days. The first time, God writes the, the tablets, the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Uh, of course, Moses smashes that, gets pretty angry with the people. Uh, he intercedes for the people. He goes up a second ten, uh, for a second forty days, or the third, uh, and that which being uh, forty, then forty intercession, another forty. So there's a hundred and twenty days exactly between the uh, Shavuot, the, the when the word is given, um, which is the fiftieth day after Passover, and and this day coming up on Friday. Hallelujah. You can read all of that in, in Exodus 34. What was the significance of this particular, this last particular 40? This is the day when God reveals his name to Moses. Yud, hey, vav, hey. Yud, hey, vav, hey. Picture value of that hand, behold, nail, behold. The, the redemptive purpose of the Messiah, Messiah, the Mashiach, in that very, very name. So Leviticus 23.32, it should be a day of Sabbath, of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls. Now, where do we see that in the New Testament? It's interesting. If you quickly go over to Acts 27, and you find out that the New Testament church was still very much active and understanding and walking in the revelation of all of these things, and, and the, uh, uh, the feasts and festivals of the Lord... Acts 27 verse 9, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Now that, that may not mean a lot to you right there, but when, in, when the fast is referred to, a specific day called the fast, Yom Kippur was known in the calendar as the fast. So this is a, re, this is a reference to the time of year this was by identifying Yom Kippur as the signpost. The, the fast. So why would the New Testament make an assumption that everybody would understand what was being spoken about here? Because we were never supposed to have lost this information. We were never supposed to have lost this revelation. So it also, uh, Yom Kippur, because of its cleansing dynamic, because it would, people would be, the nation would be cleansed by this for a whole other year, it was also known as new beginnings or a time of new beginnings. Uh, so people felt cleansed by it. People felt uh, um, freed by it. Uh, for the Jew, everything rested on this day. It was a day when the sins were covered. Uh, the sins were removed from them in that sense uh, by being covered by the blood. It, was signific it signified a new beginning. But it was something that had to happen every year. So this, had, this process had to go on every year in the temple. The sacrifice had to happen. Prophetically, it represents new beginnings for the entire world or for the, and for the Jewish nation and, and, and significantly for them. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, at the end of a thousand year millennial reign of Christ, God's going to fold the whole thing up and create a new heavens and a new earth. This also has re reference and relevance to that. What many Christians fail to understand is that not everything has been accomplished in the natural yet. If you don't believe that, just read the book of Revelations. There is things in your future. There are things yet to be done. There are judgments yet to be poured out, not on the church, and not in, in terms of individual redemption, like Jesus has paid the price for all. That was the finished work of the cross. But there is specifically judgment of nations. There is national judgment to take place. God is going to separate the nations. Now my prayer, and I hope what your prayer is, that, is that Australia will walk out its prophetic destiny and fulfill it to its to its purpose, to the purpose why, why this nation even exists, all the way right down here on the other side of the earth from Jerusalem. From the rising of the sun, this part of the world, Australia, New Zealand, the islands of the Pacific, all the way to the setting in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I believe Australia has a very important destiny. 
The Smith Wigglesworth, many of you have heard, uh, prophetically uttered to, concerning Australia, New Zealand, and the islands, that the last great revival on earth would, would manifest here, uh, and there would be a great outpouring that would, would take place here. And many people have prophesied over this that, that, things would, that this was the ends of the earth from Jerusalem, uh, that, that things would start from the ends of the earth and then go all the way back uh, to Jerusalem again. Hallelujah. Um, Jesus has accomplished what was necessary to bring individuals back into relationship with him. But God has uh, a, a purpose in looking at nations as well. Uh, Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Now, that was, that was a psalm, that was a pr prophetic utterance there. Uh, atonement means to cover like a credit card, uh, like to cover you temporarily. How many of you know if you put something on your credit card, you, don't, you can't forget about it? You can't just, well, it's paid for. No, actually not really. It, what it means is someone else has paid for your groceries or for your petrol or for whatever, and you now have to pay them back, right? So it's a temporary covering of that payment. And I would suggest you pay it before interest is due. I hate interest. Uh, don't get into the place of paying interest on credit cards. I don't even know how the interest rate that they can charge is legal. If you tried that, you would be arrested. Uh, you can't charge that kind of usury. Usury, by the way, is actually something quite serious to God. Uh, but anyway, um, if you're going to use one, use one and, and get it paid off within 55 days or 51 days or 40 days or 30 days or whatever your credit card allows you to and uh, use it. Don't let it use you. Amen? Uh, these days, it seem, seems that you, know, you can't rent a car or book a hotel without one. But if you're going to, use it. Don't let it use you. Hallelujah. So anyway, all of that, I wasn't going to say all of that. That uh, was just a little bit of financial advice for you. Not that I'm a financial advisor. I'm just making that point made to the, everybody on the internet and everything else. Not a financial advisor. But that, is, that should be a no-brainer. Um, Yom, <laughs> trying to get back onto my subject real quick here. Uh, Yom Kippur shows the atoning or the covering of sin uh, by blood, um, uh, but also the final removing away of sin nationally. So there is going to be a national dealing with the nations and with Israel that has to do with Yom Kippur. Micah 7.19 says, He will again have compassion on us, and He will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Prof a prophetic utterance by Micah concerning Israel. Jesus, or Yeshua, did, did go into the heavenly holy of holies and sprinkle the blood of the temple uh, uh, on the temple veil, sorry, on the temple, in the temple, the heavenly temple, through the veil that was torn, which signified the opening of God's way into the presence of God. The individual now gets to the Father. So again, what does the Christian have to learn or understand about Yom Kippur? The church has a very important part. I believe it is our place of intercession. I believe, I believe we can go into the presence, much like Esther, who, who ran into the presence of the king. Now, remember, Mordecai couldn't go in. Remember that? Mordecai couldn't just go in into the king's presence. Now, he was a Jew that sat at the gate, but Esther could run in. Now, she still risked her life. She still had to put her life on the line here. But she could go all the way into the king and make an, inter make an intercession. Now, the church, and Esther, which, which she really wore a Gentile face, but she was a Jewish heart. And, and the church really is in the same way, represented that way in, in the kingdom of God and in the nations, is that we have a Gentile face, or a face of the nations, a face of, that didn't come from a Jewish lineage necessarily, but we do have a Jewish heart because we are in Christ who is the Messiah of the Lion of the tribe of Judah of Israel. Hallelujah. So we've been grafted in to that. Praise God. So it's a holy convocation, uh, and, uh, and it's important for the church to understand and play a key part in the redemption of Israel. And the longer the devil can keep the, the plan uh, of God from the church concerning Israel and concerning that redemptive purpose, the longer uh, he can try to delay all sorts of things. So we've got to understand this. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews in the New Testament. 
Hebrews chapter 10. Praise God. And from verse 4, we read this. For it, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, I sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin you have no pleasure. So the church of Jesus will never find, fulfill the call of Jesus without understanding our part in the redemptive place of Israel. There, there was, it was never God's plan and purpose for those blood sacrifices to continue on forever. Through Jesus, we've now been positioned through his high priestly position and, and through our, our authority by being seated with Christ to be directly with the Father to intercede. Now, on this particular day, the high priest would re re remove his royal robes, his normal daily robes with the little bells around the bottom and the pomegranates and all of that sort of stuff. You can read into the, how intricate those, those, that clothing was. And he would put on simple white linen robes for this particular day. Um, it's quite possible that uh, you may have heard that uh, on that particular day, um, the priest went in and he had a rope tied around his ankle. You may have heard of this and he's gone into the... And the reason they did that was because if he was any sin in him, he would die and they couldn't go in to get him. So they have to pull him out with the rope, which meant that they would listen for the jingling of the bells. And when the jingle bells stopped, nothing to do with Christmas, when the jingle bells stopped, uh, then they think, OK, he's died and they pull him out. Well, that, that's, it's just not true. It's just not accurate. He's going, he goes in there with, with white robes. He's not going there with a bit of old rope. That would have got him in trouble. And secondly, he's not wearing the, the robes with the bells on. He specifically takes those off and puts the white linen robes on. So, you know, don't let the truth get in, you know, in the way of a good story, I suppose. Um, anyway, uh, the priest would go in and let's look at what he would do. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 3. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place uh, with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put on holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats and of the sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. So the high priest would, uh, would then go and sprinkle blood seven times on the altar. Uh, he would uh, get, of course, you, if you think about it, you're wearing white linen. This is, you know, if he, wore, if he wore any other color, it wouldn't be quite as graphic as this, but he's wearing white linen. And so he's, now I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but it doesn't matter how careful you do this. You, take, you dis, dip some hyssop in a bowl of blood and you're sprinkling that seven times. You're going to get blood all over you. So he is starting to be now covered in blood. Sounds pretty gruesome, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds pretty icky, but it's very graphic in its detail. Uh, Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as, as wool. One of the things that was done on Yom Kippur was that it was a, cast, a lot that were cast for the two goats, which would be the Lord's and which would be the scapegoat. The Lord's was sacrificed, the scapegoat was sent off into the wilderness, uh, the right hand and the left hand. It was hoped that the Lord's goat would be at, on the right one. They tied a scarlet thread on the scapegoat and on the temple door. Uh, tradition says that that scarlet thread would turn white supernaturally, both on the, scarlet, uh, on the, on the scapegoat and on the temple door. Uh, tradition also says in, some of in the historical writings that, uh, that a number of things happened. Uh, the Talmud, in fact, in fact, itself records that four events happened. Uh, 40 years before the temple was destroyed, so 30 AD, 30, A, 30 AD, um, <clears throat> so 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the, the lot for the Lord's goat would, fa would fall to the left hand, the scarlet sash stopped turning white, the westernmost light in the temple menorah would stay lit and the temple doors would keep opening by themselves. That would freak you out a little bit. Temple doors kept opening. Well, Jesus, you think about it, what happened 30 AD? Uh, you know, we've got a, a very significant event that took place, being Jesus' death. Hallelujah. Um, 30 years after the birth of Jesus. What the Talmud 
doesn't explain is why. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, go back 40 years, and you come to 30 AD, and that's 30 years after Jesus' birth. Now, let's look at Jesus and Yom Kippur. Leviticus 25, verse 9. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day, on the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Now, just briefly, the day of atonement uh, was the, the, also the day of Jubilee, when a particular liberty would come to all people every 50 years on the day of atonement. Uh, 50 years on the day of atonement, uh, the Jubilee was sounded and everybody's property went back to them. There was an absolute liberty. Nobody was in debt anymore. Uh, Isaiah 61 prophesying about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Uh, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim, what? The acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, the day, the, the acceptable year of the Lord is the, the uh, jubilee year. It's the redemptive year. Uh, this particular passage is the passage that is proclaimed and spoken on this day. If you go into a synagogue on Yom Kippur, uh, they will uh, bring up the uh, book of Isaiah and it will be found this particular passage and this particular passage will be read out to proclaim Jubilee uh, and, and that happens every 50th years, year. Now let's go to Luke chapter 4 and see Jesus in the scene, in verse 14, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Well, let me just, before I read this to you, uh, just also let you know, the scapegoat would wander off into the, into the was, sins were laid upon the scapegoat, and it was sent off into the wilderness uh, to die. But every now and then, as goats do, had a mind of its own, would wander back into town. If you're rejoicing because your sins have been removed from you and that which represents your sins wanders back into town, uh, people are going to not be so pleased with this. You know, you're all rejoicing, having a party, hallelujah, we're clean, we're free, and you hear, ah, you know, <laughs> no. And so what uh, tradition and a number of historical writings uh, says is that what they would do is they would take it out into the wilderness, but they would just take it to the wil out into the wilderness to the edge of a cliff. And then they would nudge it off the edge of the cliff. There's no way that goat's coming back into town. That's just a matter of historical uh, record. But with that in mind, listen, listen to this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, why? Because he's a rabbi, and he, was, he would do this often. He walked straight up to the pulpit. Nobody questioned him. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, not just any old Sabbath. Now, this, this particular Friday coming up, Friday night, going into Saturday, ha just so happens to be a double Sabbath. It's not just a normal Sabbath, but it's a high holy Sabbath. But if Yom Kippur falls on a Tuesday, that also makes the, that particular Tuesday a Sabbath, a high holy Sabbath. So Jesus walked into the synagogue, not just on any old Sabbath, but on a particular Sabbath, a high holy day Sabbath, a Yom Kippur, and stood up to read, and he was handed the book of Isaiah, and he, when he had opened the book, he specifically did this. He found the place where it was written. So Jesus is now going to speak out and fulfill what, what he is as the Lord our Jubilee. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now something strange happened. He didn't finish the chapter. He didn't finish the passage. He closed the book. He shut the book before uttering the words, what? and the day of vengeance of our God. Why? Because between Jesus' death on the cross and His return again to the earth, 2,000 years were about to, to transpire. 
the clo- really we're talking about the gap between Daniel's 69th and 70th year, which is a 2,000 year period in history. It's almost like, to, to some degree, the pause button's pushed in the middle of this chapter. The pause button from, way, from Jesus' proclamation of liberty and grace to again when there will be a judgment. Literally, the judgment had to be paused to enable some things to happen for really what it was is the nations, not just Israel's liberty, but God is interested about every single man, woman and child on this planet so that, the, the, that He could reach out into the nations so that the nations weren't immediately judged in that moment. So he hands the book, closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Verse 28, let's jump down to there. So all those in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath and they rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him where? It's interesting. To the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. They didn't realize that even prophetically they were recognizing that he would die for their sins. Now, of course, they were confusing this because he wasn't going to be the Yom Kippur bull or the scapegoat necessarily in that particular season of his coming. He was going to be the Passover lamb. Now, they mixed up this quite, quite often. They're watching for Messiah, and so they kind of keep hooking into what's going to happen for when Israel sees their Messiah, but they missed a lot or most of his first coming as the lamb. And so... Uh, it, it, I, I really quite enjoy this because remember Jesus came and he, he took off his divinity so he didn't do this. Uh, he didn't flick a God switch. He did something quite amazing next. Okay, they're standing, there's a crack crowd against him. He's right on the edge of the cliff, nowhere to go. And verse 30 says, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. They're like, where'd he go? <laughs> Where did Jesus go? He just... I know he put on the armor of light, is what he did. He put on the armor of light, and they could not see him. Hallelujah. And uh, if you will, if you want to, um, there are some wonderful missionary books of missionaries who have been able to do exactly the same thing walk through the midst of people, uh, suitcases full of Bibles with just a thin layer of clothes on the top. And, uh, you know, the KGB open up the suitcase, push down on the clothes. It goes all the way down like it's just full of clothes. Hand it back. Just miraculous, supernatural changes of nature. Uh, people walking through uh, danger zones where, where literally bullets uh, just pass through them, miss them without hurting them. Uh, where armies didn't even see them. Amazing stories. And Jesus is just demonstrating that armor of light right there. Um, there are prophetic messianic appointments in Leviticus and Revelation. Leviticus 16, verse 12, Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar of the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring him inside the veil, and it shall, he shall put incense uh, on the fire for the Lord, and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. He shall kill the goat, the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. Now after Jesus' resurrection and before his ascension, he went into the heavenly places and sprinkled his own blood to cleanse the heavenly tensils. This is because Adam's dominion actually went right up to but not included the very throne of God. He didn't, have to, he didn't actually have to sprinkle the blood on the throne of God, but he did on the mercy seat, and that which represented us uh, and everywhere Adam had been. Uh, and uh, if you quickly go over to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 11 through 28, uh, you'll see the entire passage there deals with the heavenly sanctuary. You want to you 
a detailed description of what part of heaven looks like. The book of Hebrews it goes into great detail right here to say exactly what it looks like. It's quite stunning. Uh, and it took, Jesus took his own blood in verse 12. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Uh, and it goes on in verse 14. How much more the, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience? Uh, and you can go on and you can read right through that passage. And I, and I trust and I encourage you to do that. Now, with the destruction of the temple, uh, Jews, uh, what do they do? What would you do if you're a Jew and uh, you believe uh, that you're still waiting for your Messiah and everything's wrapped up in sacrifices and there's no temple? I mean, that'd be quite confusing. Uh, so they've taken scriptures like Psalm 120, well, sorry, 141 uh, and verse 2, which says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. So they've seen that there is a way to continue the sacrifice and the offerings through prayer and uh, mitzvah or, or, or worship or different activities that they do. Um, now our prayers uh, also have a similar effect. Our prayers go up like incense before the Lord. Our worship is received like precious incense also before the Lord. And that's why we've got to also see our part as intercessory in this time. So we are, as the church, have got to, we have got to pray for and intercede for the nations, to reach out and preach the gospel to the nations, and to pray for and reach out to Israel, that their eyes would be open, to be able to see their Messiah. Um, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Can you hear that? That the, these, these prayers of the saints came, come up before God like this, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Man, you don't want to be on the earth for what's next. But our prayers went up or go up and are used to go up before the Lord as incense. Isaiah 63 verse 1. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? The one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Uh, why is your apparel red? This is interesting. This is important to understand. And your garments like one who treads in the winepress. I've trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. For I've trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I've stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. Can you see the parallel there? This is now speaking of a time when the day of vengeance would come at the end of this particular period of time we're in right now, which will be a tribulation time and a final judgment. But it is always, interestingly, there are a number of harvests in Israel, but the judgment time is always connected to the harvest of the grapes, which is representative of blood. So, so you, you can... Clearly, you, you cannot be confused with the different harvests and the different festivals. So that then tells us of this particular time of year. This is grape harvest time. They, the grapes have just been harvested in Israel at the end of the year. And we just stepped into the beginning of the new year, which is when uh, there's lots of grapes around. Now, remember, Jesus stopped short of announcing the day of vengeance. But here, is the, this is where the day of vengeance is seen. Revelation 11, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud noises in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have come, have become, sorry, the kingdom of the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come and the time of the dead they, that they should be judged. 
and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The, then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. You, you, you've heard of, um, you know, the, the, the lost ark, the, what is it, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, this is the real thing here, right here. The, the temple doors are open, and the ark of the covenant is seen in the temple, and there was lightnings, noises, thunders, and earthquake, and great hail. Man, what a day that's going to be. The temple doors... Being open was a signif signification uh, or signifying Yom Kippur, the opening of those temple doors. Matthew 13, Jesus said, The field is the world. The good seeds uh, are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares of the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Exodus 23, 16, the feast of harvest the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field, the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruits of your labors of the field. Revelation 14, 18. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully right. Now, the only reason I'm reading all of you might get, be getting a little lost here, but the only reason I'm reading all of these scriptures together is I want you to see they all represent the grape harvest, which is that time of judgment. It's a time that has not yet come, but it is a time that is coming. Hallelujah. That should motivate us. There are people, there are people dying and going to hell out there, folks. There are people that need saving. There are people that need to hear about Jesus. Right now, right now, there is a tremendous grace, a tremendous amount of mercy, a tremendous love, the, the blood of the Lamb. Uh, people can come in and just their lives can be changed. And we've got a short amount of time left to tell people of this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revelation 19, verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning. He was God. His name is the Word of God. And at the end, He's going to be known as what? The Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed Him on white horses. Folks, this is us. Do you know how to ride a horse? Better learn. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not just angels. But the armies of heaven, that's us coming from heaven. Hallelujah. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. There are a number of harvests in Israel, as I've mentioned. But one is at the end of the year represents the grape harvest, the wine, the blood. It all points to the same thing prophetically. So what does it mean for us? Man, this is a call to fast and pray. We need to fast and pray for the nations that traditionally have not accepted or, and yielded to God. It's a, it's a time to fast and pray for Israel, for its prophetic destiny. It's a time for us specifically in Australia to pray for this nation. The pressure's on, folks. As a, as a nation, as, a, as what we call a sheep nation. A sheep nation. We need to pray and fast. Why? Because there's a veil over the nations and there's a veil over Israel. What do I mean by that? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so now, listen to this. Have you ever wondered, how, come, how can the Jews not see that Jesus is the Messiah? How can they read the Psalms and not see the suffering servant? How can they, how can they, how can, you know, we've, I've heard m many times when I'm teaching on DTSs and I go through all the prophetic significances. So they say, well, how can the Jewish people not see this? This is the scripture that tells us how come and why God's done this. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. 
But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lays, lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So there is, there is a veil, there is a covering, which God has put over the eyes of the Jews so that the nations will come in. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 25 verse, uh, of Isaiah Sorry, chapter 25 of Isaiah, verse 7. He will destroy the, on this mountain the surface of the covering over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations, that which is blinding even your next door neighbor who's not Jewish. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Praise God. So we've got a responsibility right now as Australians to support Israel and as Christians to support Israel. As Australian Christians to reach out to the lost of this nation, whether they be Jew, Gentile, or whatever. And also to pray and believe God for Israel so that what we need to do in this nation can be blessed and worked out as well. How do, why, why do I say that? I didn't. Jesus did. Let me show you. Quickly go with me to Matthew tw chapter 25. Reading to you from verse 32 from the New Living, Living Translation. All the nations will be gathered together in His presence. So this is talking Jesus now prophesying a time where all the nations are gathered together at the end of the age. And He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now many people have read this, and I've heard people talk about this and preach on this, that you're, either, you're, you're going to be judged as either a sheep or a goat. No, you individually will not be judged as a sheep or a goat. It's not about individuals. It's about nations. So what we've got to see and believe, I believe Australia is a sheep nation. It is destined by God to, right until the end of the age, Stay connected to prophetically Israel. Hallelujah. That's my belief. I, be, I know many people who believe that. The United States is another one of those sheep nations. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, All the nations will be gathered in his presence and will be separated as people as the shepherd separate, separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. This is the nations. He separated the nations, the peoples. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your house. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous will cry, ones will, will, will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and clothe, give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, my brethren, you were doing it to me. Now, again, Jesus. This is Jesus speaking before his resurrection. He, there, is, there, he, there, is, there is no church. There is no church context here. He's talking to people in the nations who were judged righteous. And he said, the reason you've been judged righteous is as a nation, either a sheep or a goat nation, those who are on the right, the sheep, you are judged righteous purely because of one thing and one thing alone. The way you treated my family, my brethren. In the context of when Jesus said that, he was not talking about how they treated the church. Nations generally don't treat the church a particular way. It's how the family of Israel whom Jesus was born into is the reference that he is making here. How a nation treats Israel is of import to God. That is why in the blessing right back in Genesis chapter 12, if, if you bless Israel, you are blessed. If you curse Israel, you are cursed. That is the scripture that leads right through to what Jesus is explaining here. So as a nation... 
We need to pray for our Prime Minister and our government that they will make decisions that are for, for the advancement and the protection and the blessing of Israel. Every time a, a sitting Prime Minister or President gets too big for their boots and decides they're going to chop Israel up and, and give away land and so forth and so on, that's the, end of that. that's the end of that leader right there. They just do not last another term. You can't do that. You've got to be on the right side of what God is wanting as a sheep. Australia, for the most part, have, for the most part has stood on the right side of history and on the right side of the blessing of Israel. A few years ago, we went off into a little bit of a, a goatee kind of uh, stance under particular leadership, and we made some bad decisions uh, and, and in terms of resolutions in the United Nations. But thank God that strengthened again, and we are making right decisions, for, mostly. New Zealand has made some very bad decisions lately, and as uh, many Christians, New Zealand Christians, have been very repentant over, over that, the stances that have been taken concerning Israel. But I believe Australia, for the most part, is, is that. We need to continue to pray for our governments. Hallelujah. Uh, that they continue to do that. Of course, then those who, who were on the wrong side of that uh, go on and he, he says, uh, the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed into this eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. God didn't prepare hell for people. It was prepared for the devil and his demons. But those who are on the left-hand side of history and the nations, the goats, are going to go to hell. That sounds strong. That's Jesus saying it. For I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you, gave me, you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger. I mean, can you, I mean just to graphically explain this to you, uh, think of, think of um, uh, some of the stories that you hear. Um, now, the name just eludes me in Holland in the, in the Second World War. Um, hiding place. Corrie ten Boom. Think of that example as somebody who hid, clothed, gave water, drink, shelter, protection to Israel, to Jesus' brethren. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, that's a, that was an individual or a family that were doing that, but, but there, were, there were nations that had to make a stand. Hallelujah. He it it says, they will answer, I tell you the truth, you refuse to help the, the least of these, my brother, brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they would go away into eternal punishment and righteousness would go into eternal life. Hallelujah. Well, what's going to happen? Well, eventually that veil is going to be lift, lifted. Ezekiel chapter 20 prophesies it. He says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I'll plead my case with you face to face. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Hallelujah. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication and they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him who mourns and for his only son and grieve for him who grieve. They're going to see Jesus and they're going to realise that, that he's the one that they, that they pierced his hands and his feet and his side. John 19, 37 and another scripture says they shall look on him whom they pierced. So we have an actual New Testament scripture in the book of John which confirms Zechariah is accurate in its interpretation for that particular time. Revelation 1, 7 is another passage. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him even so. Amen. And so, and so we're going to, going to see. Hosea 5 prophesies uh, uh, in verse 15, Again I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offence, and they shall seek my face. Chapter 6, uh, and it goes on, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, uh, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us. After two days he will revive us. Think about this. The day, of, uh, day with the Lord is as a... Thousand years. After two days, this is the prophecy for Israel, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. That's talking about the millennial reign. On the th after two days, revive. On the third day, 
raise them up, that they may live in his sight. Um, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the ladder and the formula of rain to the earth. It's been two days since the Lord went to heaven. We're about to enter into the third day. God's about to move on the Jewish nation, on the Jewish people. And they will say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As prophesied by Jesus himself, Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I will say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And finally, uh, Romans 11, verse 25 Paul is teaching, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until. So there is a blindness only for a period of time. And then there's an until. Until what? The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The nations when God has been able to reach out and go into all the world by our witness to the nations until the Gentiles has come in. And so, what? All well, Israel will be saved. Praise God. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will return away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. With who? With Israel. When I take away their sins, Yom Kippur. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. The gifts, the callings, and the promises of God that were given to Israel will not be revoked. They will be true for eternity. Hallelujah. Praise God. Peter preaching to the Jews in Acts 30. I know I said finally, but Peter Acts, Acts 30. Finally, my brethren. Um, Peter preaches it preaches about Jesus you can read it later for yourself preaches that their sins would be blotted out that he would send Jesus whom heaven verse 21 must receive until the times of the restoration of all things Romans eleven fifteen. 15 for if their casting away is reconciliation of the world what will their acceptance be but life from the dead what is this talking about? Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. How many of you have heard of the terminology of new covenant? You all heard the terminology new covenant? How many of you thought that that was specifically and only relating to the church? Let me give you its context now. I will make a new covenant with what? The house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that took, took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, I will write on their hearts, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they, will all, they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord. Praise God. So all of that, all of that added together gives us an understanding and a responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. We have a responsibility to intercede for the nations, to reach out and go to every tribe, every tongue, every people, everyone we can find. And we have a responsibility as the church to continue to hold before the Lord, the people of Israel, because God has a covenant with them. And if he had not made an everlasting covenant with them, then what was promised concerning Messiah for us and the nations could not have been fulfilled. And so because of that, and because of the blindness in part that was upon them, which might sound unjust until you see the, the end of the book that God says now. What seemed to be an injustice for a time is now going to be a blessing 
because it's going to be part of harvesting and bringing in Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand up with me? I know that was a lot to get through. and we have, Man, there's a ton of scriptures in there. We only do that one once a year. <laughs> and it's important to remind ourselves of these things because there's so much ignorance, generally speaking, in the church concerning these things and, and uh, theology. And, it, and it's, it's, I know it was a mammoth lecture, it felt like, but, but it's important for us to get these things in our hearts, to see our intercessory place right now, to see the commission, the commission of Jesus as high priest, to see what his blood really means for us, for the nations, and for Israel. So Father, we just come before you right now. Come on, let's just pray. We come before you right now in these days. And Father, we pray for the church. We pray for the church, Lord, that the church in this hour would rise up and be all that you've called us to be. We pray for the nations. We pray for our nation. This great south land of the Holy Spirit, Australia, New Zealand, the islands of the Pacific, the, the Pacific this region of the world. And we pray, Lord God, that your power be seen, that your glory be revealed, that the wind of your Spirit would blow across this great land. And men's hearts and women's hearts would melt at the name of Jesus and the testimony of your good news. And we pray for Israel. We pray for that tiny little piece of land. But more than that, we pray for Am Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, not, not just those that are just, try, that are just descendants they just live in whatever they want to live. But Father, for those whose hearts are tender, who are looking for you, who are chasing after you, Lord, that they would find Jesus, that they would find their Mashiach to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Father, we pray for this right now. As a church, make it clear our part, our intercessory part, let us be found as a nation to be washing the feet, giving water, drink, clothing, visiting your brethren, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, we thank you for the ingathering and the harvest time. Lord, we thank you right now that there is a harvest of sheaves, there is a harvest of wheat before that grape harvest. This is the harvest now, Father, that it's time for us to bring them in, to gather in the harvest before, before it's too late, before that judgment harvest. God, help us to do our part. Help us to not be slack, not be slothful, to br bring in the sheaves, to bring in with joy men, women, children, to come into your presence to worship you. Hallelujah. So when we meet you in the clouds on that day, may we be surrounded by millions that we've had a part in bringing into your presence. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, well done. I'm not going to keep you any longer. That was long.